to our roundtable discussion on the contributions and history of African Americans in Las Vegas. My name is Sonia Horsford and I'm joined today with a distinguished panel of women who will be talking about the history of Las Vegas, specifically around the issues of education, the Economic Opportunity Board, and the role and development of black civic organizations in Las Vegas. And so I want to start by introducing the panel today. Um, we have Dr. Esther Langston, who is a professor emeritus at UNLV. We also have Verla Davis Hogard, who served as the director of Clark County Social Services. We have Ida M. Gaines, who currently serves as the regional representative of U.S. Senator Harry Reid. And we have Dr. Linda Young, who serves as our president of the Clark County School District Board of Trustees. Welcome and thank you for joining us today. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Well, many of you, or actually all of you, have been um, in Las Vegas um, for several decades now, actually. Um, <laughs> we know that Dr. Langston has been there here since 1963. Ms. Hogard, you've been here since 1962. Ms. Gaines has been here since 1959. And Dr. Young joined the city in 1976. And so what we'd like to do is just to get a sense of what um, education was like during that time, K-12 and higher education. Um, what the government and social service organizations were like um, and their relationships with the African-American community and also the emergence of um, black civic groups and women's groups during that time. So if we can start by maybe talking about um, the public schools and um, school desegregation and segregation in Las Vegas. What was it like during that time? Okay, well I'd be happy to start. Um, I came here in 1976 um, from Colorado, Colorado Springs as a matter of fact, and when I came here, I came here as a school psychologist. My training was a high school teacher, so back in Ohio, I was a high school teacher for about four years, and then moved to Colorado Springs, and then subsequently moved here to Clark County School District, uh, Las Vegas, Nevada. The question of how was public schools at that time, um, it, it, was, it was quite, I might say disconcerting, quite frankly. Um, the African-American children at that time, when I came in the Clark County School District, uh, did not go to school in their community. Uh, many of them were bused out, most were bused out. Many were bused out to schools, um, sometimes passing three and four elementary schools, and certainly their middle schools and high schools uh, were perhaps way across town. The African American children were responsible for integrating the Clark County School District, so um, for the most part, um, a Caucasian students, other culture students, went to school in their community, but African-American students had to go out of their community to various parts of the city to integrate the Clark County School District. Uh, for many of us, that kind of was the standard barrier, if you will, of how the school district operated. And of course, as you know, down the line, um, that became quite a concern for many community leaders, for churches, for parents themselves in the community because students often had to be on the bus, sometimes getting up about 5.30, 6 o'clock to get on the bus, and then transported maybe an hour, hour and a half, sometimes up to two hours, to many schools far away from their homes. So that was the condition of the school district at that time when I came in the school district. And so you're referring to the sixth grade center plan of integration that occurred in the early 1970s. Can any of you speak to what schooling was like prior to the, the, pl the integration plan? Well, I came here in 1963, and I came here, I was employed by Clark County School District at Kit Carson. My degree was in business education. At that time in Las Vegas, African American teachers could not teach in the high schools. Mm -hmm. So we had to teach in the elementary schools, and the year that I came in 1963 was a great influx of African American teachers, all ten, I think it was seven, ten of us who came and that was a big influx. Two or three or four or five had been prior to that. All the kids were in their neighborhood schools. The PTAs were very active. The neighborhood schools were booming. Kids were held responsible. We had hot lunches. And then with the, the implementation of how Clark County School District would implement the integration plan, of the plans that were put on the table they decided to go with the sixth grade center plan for which we vehemently protested against because we felt there was no way that mm -hmm. one first grade children should be standing on a corner in the dark to catch a bus to go somewhere and they were standing in front of a school. 
And at that time, when that was implemented, then they began to move African Americans into the junior high and high school. So, and, and prior to that time, except for high school, all black children went to school in West Las Vegas, except if they were going to Las Vegas High School or Rancho. Other than that, they were, and they had to go to school in West Las Vegas. And so, Dr. Langston, you talk about, um, it sounded like there was a strong sense of community around the neighborhood schools prior to the integration plan. What really spurred the decision to move forward with integration? Was it more of an, a national agenda at the time, or was it a local interest? It was in a no, the, the national agenda was pushing what was happening in the local schools. And there were several plans presented, at, but every one of them had the burden on the African-American children. And the school, Clark County School Board, in its infinite wisdom, decided mm -hmm. to go with the sixth grade plan, which meant that African-American children went to school at kindergarten and sixth grades in their communities. Every other year they were buffed out. And that just kind of destroyed that whole community sense of spirit. And, and that later actually was turned back because the community decided they wanted to go back to community and neighborhood schools. Mm -hmm. And we had the Prime 6 plan that was then developed in the 1990s, which we still uh, talk about quite frequently. Dr. Young, could you speak about Prime 6 and how <coughs> um, that has evolved over time? Well, uh, essentially what happened, it, it was a burden on the African-American child. And finally, to a large extent, people just said enough is enough. As you might know, um, the Las Vegas Alliance of Black School Educators had about 12 to 13 parents that approached us when we were um, uh, uh, working together in the community. And they said that they were tired of their students, their child, having to be responsible for integrating the school district, leaving early in the morning, sometimes as early as 5 o'clock, 5.15, 5.30, standing out in the dark. And I'm a, I'm a former sixth grade center principal. So I used to see the youngsters, not the kindergartners, they would come to the school, but the other students um, from first to fifth, standing, leaving their school, go for, and right across the street from my school, going down the street and then waiting for a bus and then going out. Now, what actually happened when the, the lawsuit was filed by the uh, Las Vegas Alliance of Black School Educators in 1989, it was to say, um, basically, we need to have youngsters and the community have a sense of schooling right there. We wanted the curriculum to be um, reflective of African-American contribution. We wanted um, all the different portables that um, sometimes schools had to have around them in order to accommodate. We wanted better buildings. We wanted a, a, a quality teachers and uh, administrators who, who would be supportive of that. And so that has now grown all the way to where it is today. As a matter of fact, next week, I think it's next Tuesday, we're going to be going over that whole Prime 6 plan. And the whole Prime 6 plan has 13 recommendations that really does seek to continue to empower those schools and provide the kind of support structurally, academically, um, um, making certain that parent engagement, uh, student uh, support, all are a part of that community and a part of the Sixth Grade Center plan. One of the other questions I had, right. because you mentioned facilities and the desire to have the facilities um, of the black schools being up to par, how old were the facilities and how were they different from um, schools that were in other parts of the community at that time? In 1963, well, the schools were all relatively the same age with the exception of the West Side School that had been built back in the 20s. Most of the other schools that were in the neighborhood and in the city, they were all built during the same time. So the facilities at that point were fairly equal. Shortly after that, they passed a bond issue and then started to upgrade the school. Okay, all right. Um, as we talk about communities, um, it's important to also talk about civic infrastructure, jobs, um, and other issues as it relates to economic opportunity. Ms. Hogard, you were actually director of social services at the county. Can you tell us when that was and what your role was? Well, I was director of, prior to going to work for Clark County, I was recruited from the Economic Opportunity Board to go to work for Clark County. And I have been retired just long enough to have to make notes to remember <laughs> what happened. <laughs> but the Economic Opportunity Board is probably one of the oldest community action agencies in the country. It was chartered in 19, 
1964 and opened in 1965 in what was the West Side. You know, where a lot of us live now is not the West Side anymore. The West Side has moved out to Summerlin and other places. But there are those of us who still live in the West Side. EOB started out with the four employees and eventually came to have maybe 600 employees. And if we took all the former employees of EOB, they would fill up this room. The former, our current mayor, Carolyn Goodman, used to work at EOB in the EOB building for, in the, for Employment Security, which was a delegate agency of the Economic Opportunity Board. And the uh, outgrowth of the Economic Opportunity Board are agencies like um, legal services. It was legal aid at that time. And Milan Brown, who later became a federal, I don't know if he was a federal judge, Federal, yeah, public, uh, federal public defender mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. was director of legal aid at that time. Nala, the Nevada Association of Latin Americans, was also a delegate agency. And I think it has evolved into what is now a very viable Latin Chamber of Commerce. So w we started off with a lot of programs. WIC, Head Start, where a lot of kids on the west side went to before they went to the public school. We had adult daycare. And one of the most important and lasting projects of the Economic Opportunity Board is KCEP Radio, which everybody knows is Power 88, but it is KCEP 88.1. And it started in a room about as big <coughs> as this table. <laughs> And you could, if you got, when you got to the strip, you could no longer hear because the wattage was so low. But it was initiated by, with a grant from the, constant for the, from the Department of Labor through the Concentrated Employment Program. And Dr. Bob Bailey was the first instructor in the radio program. We also had a dealer school, and I don't think any of them are still dealing, but QB Bush and John Edmund, who owns the Edmund Town mm -hmm. Center, were also uh, instructors at the, or students at the deal. I think QB was probably an instructor. I don't know if John was a student or if he was an instructor, but it provided a lot of opportunities for a lot of people to uh, advance in the community. We had a very sophisticated board uh, Mrs. Dondero was a board member. Charlotte Hill, who is probably the mother of volunteerism and certainly the mother of Channel 10, uh, were members of our board. Um, there were a lot of distinguished people that were on the board who helped guide the uh, organization. And um, I was privileged to work for my late husband, David Hogarth, who, under whose administration most of the current programs were initiated and uh, I was very happy to have worked there because it led me to a job for which I am now thankfully retired. <laughs> 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 and um, What were some of your fondest memories um, while you were at EOB? Fondest memories of when I was at EOB was uh, probably the people because there were not a lot of people who were educated, who came to work, who came through those doors, and we were able to um, provide opportunities for them to, uh, we, sent, we had grants that would send them to beauty school. One of the things that stands out in my mind is a very irate client who was not getting what she thought she should get, but she was going to beauty school, and she had her little case of beauty objects and she got mad at her instructor and she threw it at him <laughs> and hit him in the head. <laughs> Fortunately, it didn't kill him, but I mean, I remember that. And I also remember Esther and I worked at State Welfare together more years ago than either one of us want to remember. But I, were you there when Vince got thrown oh, down, the, down the steps? Just watching it. <laughs> <laughs> the director then was Vince Fallon and <laughs> 
somebody got irate at Vince at state welfare because they weren't getting what they thought they should get. And of course, at state welfare then, it was really very, very difficult to get into that program. Um, and this lady came in, she went to Vince's office, it was upstairs, and um, they picked him up, threw him down the steps in his chair. Oh, there were there were some tough times <laughs> during the 60s. <laughs> oh, yeah. But anyway, we survived. <laughs> As we talk about, um, you know, economic opportunity and even the economy today, what are some of the parallels that you see between what we're witnessing today in Las Vegas and the state and what you experienced in the 60s in Las Vegas? Well, there were a number of job programs back then through KCP, you could get a job. It was a concentrated employment, but you could get a job. There were training programs. I don't know what the Workforce Development Board, that is, I think, an outgrowth of Department of Labor programs back then, but I don't really know what they do in terms of job and job training. <coughs> I know in the Urban League, they have some training programs, but I'm not sure of that. You'd have to talk to LaVon Lewis, who is the interim CEO of the Urban League, as to what they're doing in terms of <coughs> jobs and job training. I know they have a lot of people employed, but in terms of reaching out <coughs> and <coughs> creating <coughs> jobs, I don't know that. Well, uh, some of the same um, problems are still prevalent today. It's about like what uh, the Urban League does is job training and looking for employment for people and that kind of thing. So some of the problems <coughs> of old still exist today. And uh, the, the Workforce Investment and the Urban League are working in concert with each other in some of those areas. Now, Ms. Gaines, you've been a longtime uh, resident advocate, um, actively engaged in c the community and politics. Can you share with us some of the things that um, you experienced um, in Las Vegas around those issues? Well, I, uh, some of the, uh, what I can share with you that um, it was very segregated. All, all <coughs> African Americans lived in West Las Vegas, and uh, we had to create our own environment for socially, culturally, educationally, and that kind of thing. And I can remember. 1963 is when um, Alpha Rho Chapter, a civic and cultural organization <coughs> of black women with diverse background, business and education, um, they created this organization to have social educational outlets for each other to address some of the social ills that were affecting African Americans at that time. And so you mentioned Alpha Road Chapter, and that was with which organization? Uh, Gamma Phi Delta Gamma Sorority Phi Alpha <coughs> Road Chapter was formulated in 1963, and they are the ones that brought the Ebony Fashion Show to Las Vegas in 1965, which was a great social event every year that most African Americans look forward to going to. Can you talk more about just the culture and the community and uh, maybe some of the social events? that people would participate in? Well, people worked together. It was like a community back in those days, and um, people worked together for the good of the community. Uh, like I said, Alpha Rho, they were life members of the NAACP, and I could remember, like every second Sunday in the month, we would go to a church in the community, and that's where the NAACP meetings would be to address <coughs> the ills that were affecting African Americans. And so it was a concerted effort among people of all walks of life who were engaged and wanted to make a difference for their children and for the future. <coughs> and when Alpha Rho was started, there was not another Greek letter organization in town. And Alpha Rho even though Gamma Phi Delta sorority was really a business and professional women's sorority. It was not a Greek letter, orga Greek Greek letter, letter. organization per se. It was not, um, it was not uh, AKA or Deltas or yeah. one of those. 
can we talk can we talk a little bit about the Greek letter organizations and other civic groups? I know that you probably among the four of you represent several. Can you talk about, you know, the history and the contributions of this, those organizations in Las Vegas? Well, we started Los Femdus, which was translated into the latest 12 in 1964. When I talked about the influx of African Americans <coughs> coming, as we got involved in the community, we were quite surprised at the ambition of African Americans to go to college. It was kind of get a job on the strip, you know, college was not in the forefront. Many of us were from the South and we had been debutantes and we thought about that experience and how that experience had been enlightening to us. So we started La Femme Deuce and La Femme Deuce's focus was always on scholarship, service, and getting people prepared to get ready to go to college as well as have a real rounded life. And then we almost celebrating our 50th anniversary and we started off with eight deads and our first scholarship was $50. Now over the <coughs> history, uh, I think when last year we have given out about $450,000 in scholarship to young ladies in this community and many of them have gone on to college PhDs. Uh, Judge Bennett was a debutante. Um, Ramona Denby, who you worked mm -hmm. with, was a debutante, and there's a long list of them, and I'm going to get in trouble because I only <laughs> named two. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> we can probably all name a lot of debutantes. Yeah, that's it. <coughs> well, and I know that a lot of these civic groups really focus on providing scholarships to college. I mean, I think that's one of the common things that we see when we talk about social events and where the proceeds um, go to. It's really to fund college education. What was higher education <coughs> like in Las Vegas um, for African Americans um, when you were here in the early years? I went to UNLV in 1970. I was the first African American female that had been hired in the whole University of Nevada system as a professor. There were two male professors there, Dr. Wilson and Dr. Barbero. So we used to call ourselves the black power group, because whenever we gathered, everybody wanted to know what we were talking <laughs> about. <laughs> um, it was quite an interesting experience. Of course, being the only black female on campus, I encountered um, many males who really thought I should not be there. But having been raised in the Jim Crow South and actively participated in the 60s, I informed them that they were baby racists. I dealt with hard code, so back up. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, and it was the integration, they started the integration school, was about 2,000 students at UNLV when I started in 1970. And we made it our mission whenever there was a job vacancy to call every black college we knew, every person we knew over the world to get people to apply so we could bring them into the university system. And we used to say for a long time the magic number was seven. It seemed like whenever we got seven, it stopped. And, <laughs> and so we had this real concentrated effort to get, get faculty in and to become a viable force <coughs> in the community and to bridge the gap between town and ground with the university. And I think Dr. Claude Perkins, when Dr. Perkins came, there was a great influx of black teachers into the Clark County mm -hmm. School District. And Claude was the first and only black superintendent, am I correct, Wendy? Until, until, until now. Until now. now. Until, mm -hmm. until, yeah, well, was. until now. Yeah, yeah but at that time, yeah. yes, he yeah. was. At that time, and a lot of the black teachers, most of whom are getting, if they aren't retired, they're getting ready to retire, came because of Claude. He was recruiting in California and in the South because he was from Mississippi. And um, a lot of the teachers that, like I said, probably are retired now, are getting ready to retire came because of Claude. Mm -hmm. Until then, there were some black teachers in the school district, but not as many as there, uh, there were when he came. Now, as um, we know right now that we've had so many African Americans that have moved into Las Vegas from other places. I mean, many of you have been here, um, as we mentioned, between the 50s and 70s, or since the 50s to 70s. Um, so a lot of people coming from a lot of different places. And so when we talk about the African-American community today, um, what does that mean to you? How do we define the black community in Las Vegas today? It's very difficult <coughs> because I still live in what was the black community. 
I don't think any of these people live in Hood, you know, which is, you know, which is okay. And I think that had, uh, I could have moved any number of places at, you know, some point in time. But when I lived in North Las Vegas, the ki there were kids that lived next door to me whose parents did not take magazines. And they would come to my house and ask for the magazines. And I, you know, they would, the girls would sit and we would talk about stuff. And um, I, th I think that was one of the things that led me to stay in the community. And, it, but the community, you know, it's, it's very hard to define the black community anymore. And where I live now, there is a major Hispanic concentration around me, which is fine because it's good to see that <coughs> another minority is able to move up into better housing. But it, for me, it's very difficult to define the black community, you know, anymore. I mean, I have to go all over town to a meeting. I mean, getting to, to some of my friends' houses for meetings is a chore. <laughs> but you and know, um, even though many of us live outside of the community, we are there quite often because yeah. we participate in organizations and different things sure. that are working on things. We go to church there every Sunday, and for our church participation, we are involved with groups and everything. Because like the Southern Nevada Coalition of Concerned Women, another aspect of education that you, we haven't talked about here today, one thing they do is for children who need additional credits so they can graduate from high school, they send, they pay for those kids because that's something Nevada does not provide for summer school for students. Mm -hmm. And um, so we get out and raise money and provide the necessary dollars for some of the children to go to summer school that need those additional credits to graduate from high school. But so what she's saying is that even though a large majority of black, you know, African Americans live outside of what was the black community, they do still participate. I know half the people in my church probably, and we go to the same church, probably don't live in the area. And I know probably the Second Baptist, they don't either. And you're, you're referring to churches that are located in West Yeah, Texas, churches that live right. in the black community. Right. Because the people that have come here go, go to the churches that they're used to going to from wherever they came. I know in my at First AME, a lot of people that go to our church came from First AME in Los Angeles, and first, you know, African American church, Episcopal churches, all over the country. So people tend to gravitate where they feel the most comfortable. What have the role of churches been? Um, for what has what role has the church played for African Americans in? I Los think Angeles? the church has played a bigger part when we first came here because like Ida said, we used to go to NAACP meeting on Sunday afternoon, fourth sun second Sunday of the month. At four o'clock we were at somebody's church going to NAACP meeting. And the pastors were involved in activities in the community. I know they were involved with the integration of the schools. Reverend Bennett who's been here longer than anybody you know. <laughs> he said that he, he could remember when he came here, better he could remember his birthday, now that's something. <laughs> but he was very active in the community, NAACP, in the school desegregation programs. So I, mean, I think a lot of the preachers were a lot more involved in activities. Of course, we have a lot of new preachers, so they're just getting their feet wet. The church was really the <laughs> hub. Mm -hmm. That was kind of the hub that kind of brought it all together. Because many people migrated here from the South where that was always the center of. And for many of us who don't actually live in the West Side, we still drive those miles to participate in church activities. I call it my spiritual renewing every week to go back to keep me grounded, even though the community has changed greatly in terms of demographics. There's still that basic thing there of the church that has remained the same and that the grocery stores still sell the foods I like. <laughs> <laughs> so, so I call it a spiritual, spiritual
spiritual grounding in it, and I think that piece of history, the churches, has been the piece for the African American community that has held firm through all of the evolutions. That's yeah. right, and I strongly agree with that because that connection that helps to keep us grounded. You know, we go there and we get replenished every Sunday to go out and do what we need to do to help make the community better. And I just listen to her voice in song every Sunday. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe we can have her uh, close this discussion. There we go. <laughs> <laughs> I was just going to add to the discussion that, you know, um, a part of the whole integration process did disperse people. I mean, it really did. And, and that's a good thing yeah. to a large extent. But it did take something away. And exactly. we all grew up in uh, a village. When I, in Ohio, we, uh, everyone lived around each other. You know, you had your grandmother and your great-grandmother and cousins. And so you always met Sunday after church over at Grandma's house. And then, they, you know, the food, the chicken and the greens and the uh, sweet potato, candy yams, all of that. And there was a sense of family, extended family and community and the neighbors, remember the front porch. Mm -hmm. You know, yes. you always had the front porch. There was a difference between the front porch and the back porch. The back porch you worked and you, you took care of cleaning things, but the front porch was for social kinds of activities. Mm -hmm. And so we lost a lot of that when we moved from where we lived, from Ohio. I moved from Ohio out here. And coming here was really kind of a culture shock to a certain extent. Mm -hmm. It took me two years to be able to connect to Las Vegas, to the Clark County area because of that. And around me, there weren't people that looked like me. And so that whole integration thing did break it down. But let me tell you where I think it's really connecting back again. We are recognizing the importance of our history and our roots and what has gotten us over. And now we're saying, we have to reach back for the young people mm -hmm. who do not have a sense of history and who do not always have a sense of understanding how the family connects and the extended family. A lot of people that helped us were not necessarily immediate family, but they were family friends. And family friends gave you a lot of support. So the difference here now is that we have to go back to our roots. And you all know that I started a program called The Village and we started the Village Foundation, is to say that we now know that the history of what it brought, has brought us over, we have to impart to the young people and we have to support them. And that it does take a village to raise a child, but it takes a village to educate a child. And we had a lot of people who weren't necessarily teachers that continued to educate us. So that's, that's an important feature that I think we're trying to recapture back here in Las Vegas. And another area that was hurt by immigration was the business community. Once upon a time, Jackson Street and all of that was thriving, thriving businesses and things over there. So uh, that really had a great impact. And that's an area that uh, we need to be constantly working on. How do we bring economic survival back to West Las Vegas? If I could just add one thing to what you sure. said. Um, three or four times a year, I know I do and others do, we go back to Seven Seas just for that purpose. Seven Seas Restaurant and others over there, we tend to, after we meet, reach a certain point, we tend to disconnect from some of those historical places that have really supported the community. And so I know I do at least four times a year, is to try to get people to go back to Seven Seas, try to get people to go back to some of the businesses that used to be, like you said, thriving. Mm -hmm. And now we're kind of in other areas and we forget about those. And I think it's real important to remember the historical significance because that was all we could get at one time. When I first came here in the city, we went to um, D Street at, and went to a a place there when the black educators would get together and meet. And then Seven Seas was a place we would go to and meet. And now that we, I don't want to say, have moved up, so to speak, <laughs> or call it moving up, we forget about those places. Yeah. And we forget about what they have done to support us. 
Well, she go to Mario's on Saturday. And Sunday. And Sunday. Uh-huh. You know, they haven't, you know, people from outside of the community, come like back. Esther, come back and get those foods that she That's wants right. to cook. <laughs> and I mean, you know, building on what you were saying, Linda, I grew up in Little Rock, Arkansas, and everybody knows about Little Rock. And I grew up with, uh, I'm a little older than the Little Rock Nine, but uh, I can remember the troops coming across the bridge to help to integrate the schools in Little Rock. So, I, d I don't f I don't really feel that I have moved up. Mm -hmm. I just feel right. like I have grown up, maybe. But I s I go to Seven Seas probably more than you do because <laughs> it's on my one of my routes. <laughs> uh, I, I I think that 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 sense of community was lost, um, and we came before Linda, so that was the only place we could live. That's we right. had to live there because we couldn't live any other place, and so that sense of community was there. We didn't worry about if you were a working parent, you didn't have to worry about your kid coming home and not being responsible because everybody in the neighborhood was going to tell you what they That's did right. and they better not go out their yard right. and they would tell you that. So that, that whole sense of community was there and as we began to integrate and people began to make different choices, that sense of peace was lost in, in that respect because that was really whole. <coughs> One of the organizations that we did not talk about that was very vital was Operation Life. Mm -hmm. Operation Life was started by Miss Ruby Duncan and it was made up predominantly of welfare women who had been felt that the system was not responding to them. We called it the Christmas Massacre because that year in December they got letters saying your grants will mm -hmm. be reduced for this, that, the other. And they organized themselves and Senator Reed and I sat on the original yeah. Operation Life <laughs> Board and I had students who participated with them who really went out and, and helped garner support and kinds of programs and things to help women who were on welfare and their children get a real sense of self-esteem and to begin to think about different ways and different opportunities for their lives and they were very instrumental. I'm glad you mentioned that because a lot of the history um, um, as it relates to African Americans in Las Vegas is centered on one, you know, the sense of the strong sense of community, but also community organizing and activism. And we haven't yet talked really about politics. So could you talk about even organizations who are active in politics and voter education and outreach and um, kind of the role that has continued to play? Um, West Las Vegas probably has one of the most active uh, voting populations in Southern Nevada. And so what contributed to that high level of participation? Well, we were poll workers. Everybody worked at the poll and on your block, you were looking at the register and if you had not voted and it was 535, somebody was coming to your house yeah. to tell you, to bring you to the voting booth mm -hmm. that we all realized in coming that the importance of voting and that we had to be involved in the churches were really actively involved in helping people get out to vote and to look at candidates and what they were would bring to the table and and who would best serve our interests not that our interests were served in in great detail and I always when I'm talking to people about history I always tell them go back and look at the Le Nevada legislative when Senator Neal was voted that how many votes that was 19 to 1 in that Senate. But he would stand on that floor and stand for whatever it was he stood for and he would say it. And it's interesting when you follow the evolutions, many of the things that he was for that they said, no, we're not doing, and he was voted down, has come to fruition over the years. And when the lines were drawn, redrawn so that we could have <laughs> candidates viable and get them elected, the community was out there hustling hard and heavy to get and, I'm, and we still, as you know, have people vote in that area. Well, you know, under the uh, umbrella, of, because uh, the NAACP couldn't be political, um, an organization was formed called the Voters League. And they would screen candidates and all of that. And, and they would even do a ballot for on election day that we would pass out to, to African Americans of people who were running for office who had our interests in mind, the things that we cared about. And, 
uh, so the black community would strongly support those candidates that had been endorsed by uh, Nevada Voters League. Voters League. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Any other thoughts about voting or other groups? We had mentioned, um, I think it was the Women's Democratic Club and the well, League was of Women Barbara Voters. Jordan, women, there, was a, there was a Women's Democratic Club before the Barbara Jordan Women's Democratic Club. And uh, I can't remember the name of the group, but there was another Democratic Women's Club. And then the Barbara Jordan Women's Democratic Club was formed, and a lot of us belonged to that. And then it eventually met its demise, and uh, some of us have gone on to the Clark County Women's Democratic Club. There was also the Black Republicans. You forgot. I about don't them. remember them. With <laughs> Leonard and and uh, Otis. Yes. And Bob Bailey and. Well, Bob Bailey ca la came later as. As a they were the Black Republicans that who who, who would always get beat up all the time by us, but always said that if you're not at the table, your things could not be known until they finally convinced us that there was really a role, for blacks in the Republican Party, and they were. Sure. They were active in their own way. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Black. I mean, I do remember that now. Thanks, Esther. <laughs> uh, yeah. well, I was just going to say, you know, um, those of us that came here, we just even without a sense of maybe feeling a, 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 a part of the community. When I first came here in '76, it took me a couple years. I think we just knew our history enough to know that voting was just, just so critical. Mm -hmm. And you had a responsibility for those that gave their lives, literally, were beaten, what they call poll taxes, and all kinds of dehumanizing things that were occurred so that you had the right and responsibility to vote. And that to do otherwise, you discredited all those people that, 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 that went before you, those that gave their lives, those that suffered in indignations, and not to vote was a slap at them. So many of us, no matter what the issues were, we, I've never missed an opportunity to vote I for that reason, either. never. Uh, I, if they check my voting, I, every time there's a vote, I'm one of the ones that get, <laughs> you know, get the five stars. And many like me uh, understood the history and the significance of voting and being responsible and being a community advocate, you know, not always agreeing with all the issues, but being out there to be able to express those issues and discuss them and learn about them. And that's probably what has carried us, uh, many of us sitting here today, forward. I, I still have my poll tax receipt. <laughs> <laughs> right. How do we continue to share that message with young people today? I mean, we did see a large participation by the youth vote um, with Obama and during the presiden presidential election in 2008. But what do you say now um, to young people, even locally, in voting in their local elections, their county elections, state elections? Do you feel that they understand the importance and that histor historical significance of voting? Do you think that that message has, I, has I come across? I think that their programs such as this should be required for many kids. When I was in high school in Little Rock, we had to take Negro history. And I, I think that I don't know what they do in the school district now, Linda, but that sh that's sh something that should be taught to kids, whether it is in the school district or whether here's an area where churches could get involved in bringing the history of the struggle to young black people. Well, and I think uh, uh, the numerous organizations that we are involved with, we have to get out there and and join forces with uh, churches in the community and that kind of thing to make sure we inform our young people of the importance, uh, the price that have been paid and they, they just can't afford not to be participants in the political process because it affects every aspect of your life. And so you should want to have something to say about that. Well, you know, the, the soul thought sometimes people say, well, I'm not into politics. Mm. If you're living, you're into politics. <laughs> if you're going to drive your car, you're into politics. If you're going to school to work, you're into politics. Exactly. If you like it or not, you're into it. 
Now, how about learning the issues, knowing about the educational issues, come down to the school board meetings, go to city council meetings, go to other county commissioner meetings. Know the issues because it's going to affect you if you like it or not. How about getting up there and making a statement about what you feel is appropriate and what is not appropriate? But if you say and kick back, and this is what we have to say to our young people, you're involved if you like it or not. Now, how about getting informed and how about getting active and getting involved? Yeah. Well, I think that's a great place to wrap up our discussion. I want to thank Dr. Linda Young, Ms. Ida M. Gaines, Ms. Verla Davis Hogard, and Dr. Esther Langston for joining us in this discussion um, about the history and contributions of African Americans in Las Vegas. I know and admire all of you women personally, and I'm just appreciative of the chance to talk about these issues with you today. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh,